Welcome everybody to Bobby Talks, dot, dot, dot. Those dots are there for a reason. It tells you that there's always more to the story. As always, I'm Robert Gifford, and on today's show, I have a long, long time friend, a man that goes all the way back to, what was it, fifth grade we met? Uh, probably somewhere around there, yeah. Oh my God. I've known this guy for as long as it can possibly be. We've started off, he hated my guts. I begged and begged and, and basically annoyed the hell out of this kid to be my friend. And finally, after, I don't know, we've been friends now for probably 20-some years, it finally paid off. I, uh, Ladies and gentlemen, the man, the myth, the legend, he is the host of the podcast, The Journey with a Cinephile. He is an author, a published author. We'll get into that in a little bit. And he is my nemesis when it comes to college sports. He is a diehard, not only a diehard fan of that team down south, the Ohio State Buckeyes, but he is a an alum from there as well, which gives him way more credence than I ever will have to the team that I'm wearing on my hat. Ladies and gentlemen, one of my best friends, David Rudy Michigan Garrett. David, how you doing, buddy? I'm good. Yourself? I'm doing all right, man. How's uh, life in Columbus? Uh, it's going good. I mean, just, uh, you know, working from home and everything like that and, you know, just trying to survive this whole thing. I got to tell you guys that are out there in uh, the, the internet world, this is the second take of this we're doing. <laughs> what we did was 15 minutes in, we were kind of cruising along, and my computer decided to do an automatic update. Well, that's because it's a school computer, and I shamelessly, uh, yeah, I shamelessly borrow the school computer so um so anyways dave uh you said uh you know last time i threw you under the bus i'm not gonna do that to set this one up but you are with your girlfriend correct yeah that's correct yep how long you guys been together um it'll be a year at the end of this month i think it's like the 27th was our first date okay okay and i i i said you know i, I heard something along the the way and he said that that's been discussed but i didn't uh, we, we won't go any further than that <laughs> Um, anyways, my man is a host of the podcast, A Journey with a Cinephile, and I'm kind of rushing into this because I thought we spent about 10 minutes uh, before of something that was really, really good. Um, he, he's someone that is a huge passion for the uh, horror genre, and we've discussed how I feel about the horror genre in many, many times. Um, but Dave, before we kind of dive into what your podcast is, explain to the audience why you have a passion for the horror genre and just kind of where it started. Um, I mean, for me is that like my father is a collector of like VHSs back in the day and he loves the horror genre as well. So, I mean, he introduced, like introduced my sister and I at a very young age into it. But I mean, for me, a big thing is that I've always kind of like, I mean, I liked it as a kid because it was just something that was fun, but the more and more I've gotten into it, the older I've gotten, I've kind of realized that kind of whatever the fears of society are, are kind of reflected in that era as horror movies. Like, I mean, the easiest one to kind of look at is the 50s, where we had a lot of sci-fi and, like, alien-type horror. And, I mean, a lot of that is being, like, seen through, like, the red scare that was going on of, you know, sure. things that are different, having different viewpoints than you do, and just different types of lifestyle. And, I mean, that can be reflected in, like, the original um, Invasion of the Body Snatchers came out in that era. So you get stuff like that. Well, when that, that movie originally hit, that really scared the shit out oh, of people. Oh, for sure, yeah. The horror genre in general during that kind of that 20s and 30s, that run then, yep. it really it was more than just science fiction. A lot of people took that stuff to heart, man. Oh, for sure. And so, I mean, and in the beginning, a lot of it was just taking like gothic literature and just adapting that into kind of the movies that you've got, like the universal classic monster movies where like we had talked about before is that there is – like Dracula, Frankenstein, like those were all like the classic monsters that they did. And I mean, it wasn't even until I want to say one of the later ones when they did like Creature from the Black Lagoon that they kind of started getting away from that. And I mean, that is even looking at something that's different from us where it's just supposed to be a creature that had adapted to be man-like. And it was kind of something that scared everybody. So, you know, it, what's interesting about um, you talked about art reflecting life a little bit is that yeah. uh, these, these horror films kind of are little time capsules yep. for the time period that they were in during that time. Like you were saying, you know, we talked about the aliens. Did you see this, uh, this uh, article that was just published last week by the Pentagon? Um, they just put out that they're absolutely, they absolutely 100% have aircraft now that they know is not from Earth. Have you seen uh -huh. this? I didn't see this one. I do know right at the beginning of the pandemic, they had reported that aliens are real, but then 
everything with COVID kind of overshadowed it. And it's like, wait a minute, what? <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't make any sense, does it? Hey, by the way, there's life somewhere else, uh, but the virus is going to, you know, you need to take it. It's overshadowing it. Yeah, it's crazy. Um, what's interesting, though, about uh, Dave's uh, Journey with a Cinephile podcast that he does is, uh, and I, we, we boasted about this in the first attempt, but I want to do it again. Yeah. He is somebody that I admire because of his due diligence, but also his persistence within the field. Um, he is on episode, I think you said 40, right? Yeah, 40 will be out Sunday. And he only does one show a week, and he puts a lot into that show. It's, a, it's an hour, hour and a half usually. It's jam-packed. Um, and he's got breakdowns, he's got thoughts and opinions, he's got kind of little clips and snippets that he sneaks in there, and every now and then he'll have a, a guest or two on the show to kind of break down and talk about their thoughts as well, right? Am I hitting the head on that? Yeah, I haven't done as many of those episodes. Um, I know we've gotten busy, so me and Jake, that the guy I had been recording with, we haven't done anything, but I've had a few people express interest on wanting to be on and kind of break other things down. So that's sure. one of the things that I kind of wanted to incorporate more after I got a little bit established where I could kind of figure out what I'm doing and kind of go from there. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. So what, what's the next step for you? Like, where would you like to see, like, what's the end game or just the next uh, step in the, the the evolution of a journey with a cinephile? Because it's not just a podcast, ladies and gentlemen. What I Dave has an extraordinary catalog of films that he yep. has reviewed and he has also put the, in like a blog-like fashion, he's put that on website as well. Like, what is the next step for you in this? What are you, what's the big vision? I'm not even necessarily sure. I know like what I'm kind of doing to incorporate usually on the show now is like the next one that's coming out is going to be my top 14. Cause that's all the films that I could get from 1940. It's going to be oh, yeah. a breakdown of the top 14 that came out from that year. I know I've had where the list of the movies that I've compiled from different like magazines and podcasts and encyclopedia where I've broken them down by, I've going through them alphabetically. It's been a long kind of journey on doing that. Even before I started doing the podcast, I do kind of want to break them down by like the letter as I complete them. So I do have like a list of my top 25 that start with like a, and I have everything for B and I'm working on finishing up for C right now, but, and I'm into the D's, but it's just been, I kind of take a break from doing that one when I kind of have opportunities to do kind of other things as well. Where, where can people find your stuff besides the uh, website? Like what, tell me your handles on, uh, on, on your social media. Um, I always post all of my reviews on, you can find them on Facebook where I'm David Michigan Garrett Jr. I post all the reviews on there. Um, I post them on Twitter where I'm Buckeye from Mish. On Instagram, it's kind of tough because they don't really do well with links on there. So, I mean, I will post the posters on Instagram, but I'm David OSU 87 on that one. And actually, the probably the easiest is Letterboxd, which is such a great app to have because I will post the full reviews on there. And I've actually noticed I've been trying to do IMDb where I post it. But the thing with IMDb is they only let you have so many characters ah. that you can post on there where Letterboxd lets you kind of just run wild on the amount of stuff. Yeah. More of a friendly forum. Um, yeah. That's interesting. Dude, you got to check out this thing. It's called Linktree okay. um, Instagram. It's a place where you can go and you can put in three or four different links. Okay. But then, and it will create a link for you, a, a main oh. link. And that link then you attach in your bio to Instagram. And then people can go there and it's just a okay. lot easier. To because Instagram, for whatever reason, is not set up yeah. for professionals to share no. Uh, maybe that's the point of it. I don't know, but that, that, yeah. they're not set up like Facebook's a little easier to uh, right. navigate in that sense. So, um, yeah. So, Journey with a Cinephile. Check him out. The website is great. It's man made. He's done it all himself. It's, uh, this man hours that this guy has put yeah. into it uh, is uh, it's awesome. It's it's inspiring to see, and I hope nothing but the best for you, my friend. So, Appreciate it. yeah, 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 yeah. So, you know. The thing about the horror genre, this is what him and I were talking about earlier in the first time, is that I've always felt like, and I, I go back to this, is that the horror genre, when done right, can tell a story yeah. that it not just scares the shit out of you gimmickly, but makes you think. And it's like, it always, I think the best ones are when they kind of are on that line of reality, right? When they yeah. blend that line and they're like, wow, this could really happen. Right. And that's what makes you, you know, so afraid and terrified of these things. My problem with the horror genre is that I've always felt like it's been polluted by these 
you know, first year straight out of college, um, no, you know, directors or want to be directors that are like, I need blood, I need guts. But I think that's kind of the charm that you guys like in it, right? Is that it's such a, tell me why people, I think it's polluted and it's so diluted, but you tell me why I'm wrong in that. I mean, you're not wrong to an extent. There are a lot of those type of films. I mean, for me, I will time, I will give time to some of those ones because for me, sometimes I can appreciate a better movie if I've watched a bunch of just garbage because I'm like, okay, like, this is what people are trying to do here. And then this is something that's really good. My kind of journey through watching some of this more low budget and stuff is to find like the gems out there that people might not have even like known about kind of being out that way. So I'm kind of taking one for the team to kind of wade through it and look for kind of those hidden gems out there that people might not even know about that do exist. Yeah. You say taking one for the team. I was telling you in the first attempt, dude, like I'm running out of time, man. I mean, not that I'm getting old or dying. (laughs) I can, if I sit down and watch something that I, I, I can feel it on my skin. I'm like, man, this is a waste of time, but I always finish that. But that's why I literally never go into a film unless I had interest in it in the first place. That's fair. Yeah. You, you and my buddy Nate is they'll watch everything so that they can get a well-rounded idea of it. I'm like, I don't even know how you guys begin to do that. <laughs> <laughs> I can't. I mean, um, I struggle sometimes. I'm not going to lie. Just so you know, like it's sometimes where I'm like, oh my God, like this is going on for another hour. Like what am I doing? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's crazy. Uh, Thanksgiving, the the revenge of the turkey that gets its uh, revenge once a year at Thanksgiving. Man, we um, showed that to everybody, though, when that came out. <laughs> yeah, and then, you know, it's funny you said that because that's the other thing about the horror genre that always pisses me off is that when you and I, we go watch a movie together or something like that, I should never leave it. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm the minority in this. But I should never leave a horror film and say, man, that movie was way funnier than I thought it was going to be. And that happens far too often. Actually, if you want to know a fun fact, the guy that directed that came out with a movie that I saw not last year, but the year before at that film festival called The Headhunter. Okay. And it, it only runs about like 60 minutes. That dude is actually a really good filmmaker. And that movie is pretty amazing for how little of a budget he had. It's a guy who was like a Viking almost, like big burly guy who's a monster hunter and he's looking for this monster that killed his daughter. Yeah. And so like, and it has this wild twist that ends up happening with it, but he went over to Spain and filmed this with a very like skeleton crew and everything. And I'm like, this is the same guy that did thanks killing. And yeah, he's actually a really good filmmaker. I I will say this in all credit to that gentleman. Thanks Killing is, it's hilarious, yeah, it, but sure. you, can, you would never be able to get through an hour plus of that film if it wasn't, at the very yeah. least, not cinematically well, For sure. right? Yep. So, like, I'm not taking anything away from these guys as filmmakers. Because oh, yeah. they're great filmmakers. Well, I mean, there's some guys out there that, yeah, like, they're literally out there just to make a buck, and you can tell that there's no, like, passion in it. And that's yeah. sometimes with me how I can get through some of these things, is because it's like, I can feel the passion here, like... You just don't have the budget. You just don't have the talent around you. But, I mean, as long as you're trying, I can I can at least give you some credit. Good. No, and that's good that you can see through that. I always get kind of um, a little upset when I'm watching a movie where I'm like, dude, that was a fantastic plot. Right. But, it, like, it was just executed poorly by everybody involved. But it is. It's like, you know, don't get me wrong. Like, everything I'm trying to do right now that you're trying to do, you know, maybe 10 years from now, if we ever get a chance to make it big in this thing or whatever our version of the success is, right. we're going to look at these early days and be like, dude, we were chumps. Like, this is <laughs> – I can see you got to start somewhere, and I appreciate that. So, I don't know. That's the horror genre. But tell me a little bit about, like, the feedback you get. Like, because that's, that's what I love about the show that I've done so far with you being my, my seventh episode. That's what I love is that – you know, you get done with an episode, you upload it, you kind of sit back and wait, well, is anybody going to check this out? I don't yeah. know. I hope so. Uh, and you literally never think about, like, the numbers. I never say it's got to hit this number or that number. Right. What I think about is, is somebody going to reach out and tell me, hey, that one really impacted my life, or I like what you're doing. Like, tell me about the feedback you're getting, man. Well, I mean, first off, I've listened to a few of yours when, like, I've had the chance, like, at work and everything, and I 
you're doing some really interesting stuff with some of the guests you've had on for sure. So I mean, so one of the things there, um, actually it's kind of funny. One of the guys that kind of encouraged me to actually start my own show has periodically been like, I think this morning, uh, my guy, he's, uh, he's from Seattle, Washington. And wow. he had commented on one of my links today and was like, I just want you to know, I read every review you post. And he's like, you just bring up some interesting concepts and stuff. And it's stuff like that where I'm like, that's why I do it. Even if it's only one person that takes something from it. Yeah. Cause I mean, I actually stopped doing the blog for a little bit just cause I got a little bit burned out on it. And I had a guy yeah. reach out to me who I don't even know who he was and was like, are you still going to like do this? And I was like, yes, I am. Yeah. Like, I like somebody. yeah. So it's, so I haven't gotten a whole lot of feedback on the podcast aspect. I've gotten a lot of it for like my blog actually. And that's where a lot of people have reached out to me, especially like independent filmmakers that I have done reviews for and everything like that. And it's one of those things where that's why it has kept me going is that the first few that started reaching out to me, I was like, I'm going to continue doing this. Not necessarily, you know, seven days a week. Like right now I'm only doing about five days a week and giving myself like a weekend to kind of breathe and recharge the batteries. Sundays I do my podcast and get everything ready to go for that. So it's been pretty, um, it's been pretty nice. Like I don't get a whole lot necessarily as much as I would like to get back to kind of, you know, know exactly what would make things better. But I have gotten enough where I'm like, okay, I can continue doing this and I feel comfortable. Yeah. And you know, what's crazy about that is you just said Washington. You said he's from Washington, Seattle, Washington? Yep. Dude, that's that's the thing, man. It's like you, you started off a little kid growing up with your dad watching these things, right? Yep. And then over time, it, it becomes an obsession. You're like, Dad, let's watch another one. Let's watch another one. Then it becomes, as an adult, you kind of sit there and you debate with your father about these things. Yeah. Debate with your friends. Debate with your anybody. But it's debating with your community of people that feel the same way you do right. about the things that you're passionate about mm -hmm. and and now that you're older and you're trying to not just you're, you're taking in what you're you're observing and you're trying to create now you're creating content for the community that you were once a part that you're still a part of and now you're getting feedback from some dude from seattle washington like i i, I can't I, I that's awesome dude I, that's yeah. i can't say enough good things about that it's a great feeling so i mean like you said it's fun to be even in my own little way being part yeah. of the community that I've loved since I was, you know, a little kid. Yeah. I would challenge you, dude. I would challenge you to kind of create uh, Instagram or Facebook, create journey with a cinephile, its own thing, make it its mm -hmm. own brand. That right. way this, I, I know you're kind of, you're, you're branding yourself at the same time, yeah. but like brand what it is. That way it's very specific. That way you, your community will come flocking to you. That's what I've learned is that, and don't get me wrong, I'm not doing a great job of getting followers and subscribers, but I don't care. That's not the point. The point is, is if it ever does come, it's there. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, yeah. Anyways, so check out Dave at Journey with a Cinephile. It's a website. He's got a huge catalog of reviews and stuff that he's done. My man has, I, I threw him under the bus in the first attempt as well, with the bus of government. Uh, he's got a huge catalog of movies that he owns. Um, he said to me over 3,000 just in the horror genre alone. So this man is a basically a walking encyclopedia. And if I've ever met somebody that has kind of a photographic memory of just Anything and everything, because this is just one notch of who this man is. Uh, uh, what we'll talk about is sports knowledge and, you know, some of the things that we connect on a little bit down the road. But uh, I want to talk about, let's venture into the book you wrote. Yeah. Kind of tag teams along with the, it's the horror genre, right? You wrote like a fictional uh, horror genre book, right? Yep. Yeah. All right. Tell us a little bit about that book. And this was, uh, what, seven years ago already? Eight years ago? Uh, somewhere around there. I mean, I know it's, I think it's been like four or five since like everything was completed. But my dad actually came up with the original story for it. Okay. And, but like he really didn't necessarily know what he was doing. He just had like the basis premise of everything that he wanted to be in it and was actually writing in Excel. And I didn't know what he was doing. Like, <laughs> like yeah. And I started reading through it and I was like, this is actually kind of interesting. And this was back when we were still in high school that we yeah. had started it. And then throughout college, I'd periodically work on it when I had time, which I mean, again, it's kind of tough when you're trying to do like your own stuff for like schoolwork, have a social life, all that type of stuff. So I periodically would like, when I could, I would sit down and do stuff. And then it was finally when I moved out to Cleveland that I was like, 
I'm just going to go ahead and self-publish this and see just kind of what happens. So, yeah, it's uh, kind of in line with, like, zombies and everything, which is what his passion has always been about. And, I mean, which some of my favorite movies are from. So we just wrote, like, a family trying to survive when the world kind of ends in a zombie apocalypse and trying to kind of recreate their own type of society where they can kind of make their own way. What's the name of the book? Plug your book where they can find uh, it. It's uh, called Ghouls. Okay, Ghouls, G-H-O-U-L-S. Yes. Yep. Yes, okay. And then we published it through um, Create Space, which is owned by Amazon. So it's actually on Amazon as where it's like listed and everything like that. And I know I've randomly done Google searches in the past. There's a lot of um, like smaller kind of websites that will also kind of do resales on it and everything. So I'm assuming they purchase it and then turn around yeah. and then sell it at like a different prices and whatnot. So Dave got his English major, or he majored in English at the uh, the Ohio State University. And uh, um, it, the thing that's crazy about that is that he also minored in film communication. What did you say you did? You I minored? double majored in English and film studies. Okay, so that kind of, I mean, this gives you an idea into the world of who Dave is. Um, so it, when I say it's going to be an interesting read to you, I'm saying that it's as somebody who knows Dave very, very well, um, he's knowledgeable on this subject. If I ever, I was on Who Wants to Be a Millionaire, and anything came <laughs> horror wise, right. my first phone a friend is going to be this man. There's no second. Um, so th th that just kind of gives you an idea of who this guy is. Um, but that being said, I, take me through the writing process and how vigorous and when you would sit down to put, you know, pen to paper or <laughs> uh, log into Excel and. <laughs> Just got some ideas down. Uh, yeah, and got some ideas down. Just tell me about that process. Because I know as a writer, you know, Dave and I, we're both movie buffs, but we go one step further. I also got a degree from Bowling Green State University in TV, film, and radio. And one of the things that I wanted to do was be a director of films. And I still think someday I might direct a film. Yeah. But in order to do that, I want to write my own as well. And I know how intense of a yeah. process that is, dude. And I got to tell you, it's simply the biggest reason why I don't have anything made right now and it's because that whole process scares the shit out of me it makes me so honestly it makes me so insecure in that moment when I sit down and I think I've written something well and I come back to it like two three days later and I just like this is garbage and I throw it away yeah and it's so defeating when you can't be like that and you successfully were able to get to the next chapter and the next chapter so tell me a little bit about the writing process I mean you're not I'm not gonna lie it is tough like there was times when I have had the same exact thing. And for me, I kind of took a lot of inspiration from Stephen King, you know, my favorite writer and everything. He had a book that he wrote called On Writing, where he was trying to help people that want to write. And I know the big thing for him that he was saying is just to kind of what you're saying is put pen to paper and at least give yourself like a deadline where you're either going to write for an hour. If you're not going to do anything else, you're going to shut off all the things that could distract you. And just do that. Or you either do like either a set time or a set amount of words that you're going to write that day. And his whole thing is really just to kind of flesh everything out that you can from beginning to end and then step away from it for a little while. And that's what I would do a lot of times is I would write something and then be like, okay, now that that's completed, I'm not going to look at this for a month. And then I'll come back and then would critique it myself and be like, okay, what works here and what doesn't work and kind of rework things or whatnot or you know, add, subtract, whatever you can. I kind of realize sometimes that I go a little bit too bare bones the first time through. And it's okay. that second run through that I'm kind of like, oh, wait, I can flesh this out a little bit more here and kind of add some beef. Or some people are the opposite where they'll go too heavy in the beginning and have to cut the trim. You know, that's good that you do that though because you kind of get the meat and potatoes out of what you're thinking onto the paper right away. Yep. And then you can kind of come back to it and be like, okay, I can stretch this, I can stretch that, I can give this a little more life or color. Right. Yeah, it's a good, it's a good, it's kind of a, it's a good note that I should give myself that I already know exists that I just, <laughs> right. I, I, I by no means am a writer and I would love to be, um, I just, I, I'm not there yet. So let's talk about, here's what I got, I want to know. Here's a man who's got a full-time job. Mm -hmm. Speaking of that, he's, uh, he's working from home right now because he's working in an office and uh, when the whole coronavirus thing is taking place, they ship them all home. Um, but he's got a full-time job. 
He's got a podcast. He's trying to maintain and run a website. And he's got a guy from Seattle, Washington, who's holding him accountable for every review that he possibly posts. And uh, I, I hope, I hope that he gets to see you on this and some of the other podcasts and uh, video logs that you're going to be doing so that he can kind of get an idea of who you are. Um, but what type of support are you getting with your significant other? Um, because it's a, it's a, it's a tricky balance, isn't it? To like pursue your stuff. Right. That's not your career and still successfully maintain and sustain a, you know, a, a healthy relationship. So yeah. what's it like, man? Well, it's kind of funny because a certain ex that I have that you are not too fond of did not support it at all and actually hated that I did the whole review thing and whatnot. But coming into this, uh, when we started getting more serious, I kind of laid all my cards on the table and was pretty much like, hey, these this is my hobby. I mean, movies are my hobby. And for her, actually, she enjoys watching movies like and there's a lot of, like, some of the ones that I won't show her because I can't have that on my conscience to scar somebody where they're not going to be able to bounce back from that. But, like, there's a lot of times where I'll be like, hey, these are the movies I need to watch this week. Are you interested in any of them? And there's some of them that she's like, yes. But we also kind of agreed that we were going to maintain our own kind of lives outside of being with each other and everything where – I didn't, like, I don't want to have like a codependent relationship where she loses her friends. I lose my friends. Like, so we kind of have made a concerted effort to be like, where we make plans for the week where it's like, these are the days we're doing this. These are the days that we're free. If anything pops up kind of like how like this whole thing happened where I was just like, Hey, I'm going to record with Robert tonight. And she's like, cool. I have this thing I'm doing tonight. So we're good. So it's kind of one of those things where really been open communication where it's like, Let's make sure that we can kind of, you know, make time for each other, but we also kind of want to maintain our own separate lives to not kind of lose ourselves. And you know what it does is it really helps um, you be free yeah. with everything you're doing, with all of your creations, because you have that type of support. It's like you're in addition to each other's happiness. You're not really the reason for each other's Absolutely. happiness. You use the word, though, that I don't like, and maybe I'm um, – <laughs> you use the word hobby. And I'm going to tell you why I don't like it. Mm -hmm. Hobby is something that you do occasionally. Maybe maybe I'm wrong in this. Maybe hobby is something that we, maybe this is a hobby for us. Yeah. But like I think I when I hear someone say, "Oh, you're just doing your hobby," it's like, no, I am. I'm more than just pursuing it. Yeah. It's something that like I don't care if it ever gets big. Yeah. But like, this is something that I take serious. I take. Um, I want it to be highly produced. I want it to be well done. But I want people to leave the experience and be like, man, we shared something there. And right. I'm we're off before it. You know what I mean? So to me, I, I really don't like the word hobby, but I get my like, yeah. you know I mean? <laughs> It just bothers me, I guess, in the long-winded way of saying it. So That's fair. But anyways, um, we are at the halfway point. Okay. So here's what I'm going to do. We're going to take a quick break. When we come back, there is more layers to peel on this onion that is Dave Garrett. Uh, we're going to get into some stories because this man is my nemesis. I wear the Michigan block M hat for a fucking reason. And that reason is because this is what I bleed. He bleeds a different color. And damn it, more times than not, he's left smiling where I'm not. We'll dive into that. Some funny stories and more with my man Dave right after these messages. From who? Nobody. But right after this break. <laughs> Welcome, everybody, back to Bobby Talks, dot, dot, dot. Those dots are there for a reason. Let's you know this motor story. Sitting here live with my man, David Rudy, Michigan Garrett. I was telling him Michigan is kind of a, kind of a funny thing. He's from Michigan, but he is a diehard Buckeye fan. He did graduate from that school. Uh, Dave, tell me about your experience at Ohio State, why you loved it so much, and why after your first year you didn't leave it and go up to that school up north. Tell me why. <laughs> um, I mean – it's kind of funny is they weren't my favorite school at first only because I really didn't have one necessarily, except that I was raised to hate the state that I was from when it came to sports. And it was actually probably when I was like fourth, fifth grade that I watched Ohio state destroy like Iowa or somebody like that. And I was like, this is my squad. And it just worked out that they were rivals with the team that I didn't like. Um, so, what's the origin story there? Why does your dad, not like Michigan himself. Like, how far back does this hatred for your own state, and where, where's the origin of it? What's the root, Dave? 
my grandfather was from West Virginia. And when he moved to Michigan for work, he didn't like how arrogant some of the people he worked with were about their favorite team. So then he started to like, well, his favorite team was Alabama. Like okay. that was the squad that he had rooted for. Like I believe growing up, he was also a Mountaineer fan. But then he ended up starting to like Ohio State and Notre Dame. And then that kind of bled down to my father. And then I didn't even know my dad was an Ohio State fan at first until years on the rocks. My dad's still favorite team. His is Alabama as well. So, like, Ohio State's his, like, third favorite team. So, And Michigan would be the dead last on that list? Probably, yeah. And, you know, usually the kids try to rebel against their parents. And that just never took place here. I don't understand. I don't understand. I blame a lot of things that I didn't really kind of shy away from for whatever reason. You know what's funny is that if you were growing up now and Ohio State was Trump and Michigan like they have been the last seven years, and years and 12, 20 years, um, you might be a Michigan fan. It's possible. I mean, it'd be tough. <laughs> it'd be tough because Ohio State would be considered the arrogant SOBs that are always, you That's know what true. I mean? So, it's just funny how life, you know, you are a product of your time, by all means. Uh, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So anyways, uh, Dave is a diehard sports fan, diehard Ohio State Buckeyes fan. Would you say the Buckeyes is the number one love before anything else? Uh, yeah, for me, it's even though I've watched them, you know, win two national championships, yeah. they still are the one that, like, I worry about the most out of all the other sports. But, I mean, college football is also my favorite sport right. out of any of them. So, I mean, it kind of goes hand in hand with that. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Actually, you know, it's funny. I used to say college football was my favorite sport. Um, I, I don't think it's my favorite sport, but Michigan is my favorite team. Yeah. Uh, NBA is my favorite sport. It's, it, and then, but Michigan is still, for whatever reason, high head and shoulders above anything else. Right. Um, that's just how I, I, I am about it. Being that I'm from Michigan and I root for Michigan, being you're you know, from Michigan and you root for Ohio State, Dave and I are naturally nemesis. We're enemies here, man. And I got to tell you some stories here. So we're at a booze. Uh, we're at Josh Long's, right? Was it his bachelor party? Yes, it was. All right, so we got another buddy of ours. And uh, this is just one of the stories that is most recent. We've got battles that go back years. That go back a long time. <laughs> so anyways, Dave and I, I've learned a couple things. That when Dave and I are feeling good, about ourselves, whether we're around people, we're kind of like back into a corner and there's a bunch of people watching us. We get pretty loud. Yeah. And, yeah. And, and Dave is somebody who, uh, you know, he's a back some brewski. You got it. Oh, yeah. 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 And uh, so we're at my buddy Josh's bachelor party. And Dave, I want to remember how much you remember of this because you were pretty, pretty, pretty wasted that night. I remember a little bit. So I remember we were playing Iowa, or we're playing Nebraska, and I was on the concourse for most of that walleye game watching yeah. that game. <laughs> so we go to the Toledo walleye game. There's probably 20 people. We get off of a party bus to go there, and uh, Dave is spending most of his time in the concourse, like you said, watching the Nebraska Ohio State game. I did not mean anything by my original probe. I'll be the first to admit that I am the one who started this, I walk up the concourse, and I don't even remember what I said, but I, I just kind of did a normal, as a Michigan fan would do it, or an Ohio State fan, or vice versa, just a, a very friendly jab about, hey, they're probably going to lose to Nebraska or something. Dave, who's already passed, you know, he's been drinking heavily for a while. Yeah, it's been a while that night. And, and palms my face, and basically shoves me back and says, get the fuck out of here. <laughs> one of my prouder moments. But that right there led to us getting on the bus fighting. That led to us. It went far beyond sports at that point. We were talking about, Robert, you think you're better than everybody. I'm talking about your English major. I'm talking about everything. I mean, we're just throwing everything. I mean, we didn't care. We didn't care at that point. And Dave and I have had some pretty good battles around here. Do you remember that night at all? Uh, I remember some of that. I don't really remember a whole lot what we said. I do vaguely remember the palming of the face and pushing you a little bit, but I don't remember a lot of the things that were being kind of – I know, like I said, not one of my prouder nights, but I yeah. do remember us kind of going back and forth from that point on. Well, it was funny because we had a captivating audience. I know that. They were loving 
every minute of it, except for maybe Josh because it was his bachelor party. But fair. Yeah. Anyways, uh, so that kind of kind of sets the foundation for who David and I are, basically as fans when it comes to Michigan Ohio State. Right. Anyways, the schedule came out, man. Did you get a chance to look at it? I did a little bit. Um, I kind of glanced at it. I mean, I saw that – I had already heard inklings that the game was not going to be the last game of the season, that they were going to move it up until – I didn't realize they were going to move it into, I believe, October is when they're actually going to play it. And I know they kind of built in a lot of open dates for every school – because they're kind of assuming that there might be issues with, obviously, the virus and possibly needing to postpone games. And, I mean, every conference is going to the conference-only schedule. So, I mean, it is what it is. And I don't have a whole lot of faith that the Big Ten is going to get a lot of respect from the major news networks. So, you know where so. I'm at. I always think we do until it gets – I think we get plenty of respect in the regular season. I really do. You don't think that? I just have issues that a certain news network owns the SEC and the ACC, and every time I feel like I turn on any of the shows, I feel like all they want to talk about is Alabama, LSU, and Clemson. Okay, so let me let me let me let me take back what I was going to say. I think the top teams. Yeah. I, I, I can see where like a team like Ohio State gets kind of lost in the shuffle amongst right. like you know, uh, an Alabama, LSU, Clemson type thing. Um, but I think when it comes to, like, the top 25, like, the AP polls, oh, stuff, yeah. Yeah. I think they always give us, you know, we, we always seem to have about four or five teams yeah. lumped in the 10 to 20 spot, maybe two teams in the top 10. So I always feel like we've got majority of our squads in that top 10. Yeah, I will agree with you there. It's like we usually are very representative, which, I, I mean, I still feel like the Big Ten is right there as being the best conference in college football. I think about the I think we're one of the deeper ones if you go top to bottom. Yeah, and I, I would say that that shift started coming back our way, oh, four years ago-ish, where yeah. while there, it was very hard to compete with SEC when it came to their top to bottom just because of their right. goals and whatnot. Um, yeah, so, but what's interesting, though, is why do you think they moved that game? I, I mean, I'm thankful that it's moved away from Thanksgiving. Why? Because- I'm not a big fan that they play it on Thanksgiving weekend. I get why you would do it because you have more people, you know, glued to their TVs and everything like that. I yeah. don't have any clue why they moved it off of that last game of the season. I don't know what was kind of, if there was some sort of scheduling conflict or something that might be kind of influence it. So I'm not sure about that or why they kind of moved it out of that last spot. I have, I have a theory. I do have okay. one. Now, the theory doesn't really match 100% because of where the game's positioned in the schedule. The game is positioned, like, right in the middle, if not a little bit towards the, the, the front of the middle. Yeah. Um, my theory on it, though, Dave, is that they really want to get this game in, right? If you're going to have any game take place, you want, I mean, at least in the Big Ten, you want it to be Ohio State versus Michigan. If, if, right. So if it's, they're going to lose your season for whatever reason, because you've seen the struggles in Major League Baseball right now and some yeah. of the things that they're having, if you're going to lose the season, you want to be able to have maybe that game first. I'm not sure Michigan necessarily wants to have that game right. so early, but I can see why the conference wants to have it. I mean, it's funny is I was listening to some sports talk radio down here um, about a week ago when I was you know running some errands or whatnot. And actually, Bobby Carpenter is on it. So, like, kind of interesting, you know, former Detroit Lion. And yeah. they were talking about kind of the schedule and everything like that and how, like, nationwide people are like, oh, the Ohio State-Michigan rivalry is dead. And he brought up an excellent point as to why it's not dead. Is like, obviously, you guys are, you know, trying to find ways to beat us. So, like, it's kind of become that, you know, Harbaugh's using that as the mantra to kind of get everything back in line a bit. And then his response to, like, why Ohio State fans is not dead yet is that they don't stop piling it on when they get the chance to. And the reasoning behind it is that, like, we don't want to leave any doubts about, like, why we hate this team so much. And that's why the rivalry to me will never die is that it doesn't matter who's winning and everything. There's still that hatred there no matter what. Oh, the hatred is never going to die. It's never going to die. I think for it to be as nationally well known, yeah. Michigan has to win some of these games. Right, it just has to happen. I, it's one of those things where, like, dude, I don't even know if in our lifetime, really, 
I mean, we're 33. I don't know if in our lifetime, Dave, we've really had a good back and forth ever. Because in our first 10 years, it was dominated by Michigan. And ever since then, you know, we, I get old enough to enjoy the goddamn thing. And all of a sudden, I can't. Yeah. I, they don't, you know, I think we've won two games in 20 years. Am I wrong in that? 04 and then 11, right? Right. And then there's the one vacated game. One, And that's unacceptable. Like, yeah. that's the Michigan fan. That's unacceptable. And I, so, so to me, nationally, I can see why they think the, the, the rivalry is dead. But it's going to have its ebbs and flows. What yeah. I ask for is that the games at the – dude, more than anything, I want us to win. But I think sometimes, more than anything, like, you know, Craig and I will be like, dude, pray this game is competitive. Pray this game is competitive. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. But, so, I mean, I can understand that logic, though, even though, obviously, like, you know, most people will be like, there's no such thing as moral victories. But there is in, I mean, I mean Craig will probably attest to this, in the recruiting game. Yes. Is yes. There's a chance that you can get recruits that might be swayed to come to, you know, Michigan for other reasons if they're like, man, that was a close game. Like, what would they have done if they had me at this position or something along those lines? So like, I know there's not really moral victories, but there is something to be said about it, though. Yeah, no, you're you're right. In that sense, there is moral victories, and they're very, they're very, like, I, when Michigan gets blown out, I'm always afraid that we're going to lose recruits. Right. Some people will be on the other side and be like, no, that might, you know, spark somebody who's a diehard Michigan fan to be like, no, I, I'm, I'm coming because I want to help save this thing. To me, my fear is that it's always going to lose recruits because it's like uh, anybody that's a diehard Michigan fan is going to come play there regardless. Right, it doesn't matter. Yeah, you want those games to be competitive so you can say, you know what, we lost this one, but maybe I'm the one that tips it over a little. You know what right. I mean? So – I don't know. We'll see. But I, uh, I saw the, I, I saw the schedule, and I just was. That was the first thing. That's the first thing you look at. Oh, yeah, you know, for sure. <laughs> you know what I mean. Yep. Uh, and with that taking place uh, October twenty fourth, like, you already know where I'm going to be in front of a TV somewhere. Yep. Um, you think there's going to be fans by the end of the season if done right or no? I know Ohio State released a statement either earlier this week or late last week that they're going to, so far, their plan is to allow very limited fans where they're going to allow no tailgating and everybody's required to wear a mask in the stadium. I don't know how long that's actually going to last or if it's even going to happen, especially with kind of some of the things that we've seen with, like, the numbers and, you know, things kind of going that way. I don't have high hopes. And, I mean, I agree with you after you brought it up that, like, I think that probably is why they put the game where it's at in hopes that the season gets ended at some point. They can get that moneymaker in, but I don't have the highest hopes for fans to be there. So, Dave, I'm going to ask you the most important question I can ask you. I'll look through the camera. Maybe we've got Dave Garrett on the show. Um, we're talking Michigan and Ohio State live. We're talking football. We're talking about cash. How did I have this? If Michigan and Ohio State play October 10th, Michigan wins that game, and then the season ends up getting canceled after, will he count that game as a victory, or will it somehow be taken back and rescinded from his fan? David, can you please answer? No, I mean, I, if, if that happened that way, I mean, I'd have to accept the result. I mean, <gasps> Sports in general are just weird right now. Like, I think everything that we're going to do sports-wise this year, obviously, are going to have some sort of like asterisks. And I mean, I'm hoping one day I can tell my grandchildren, like, gather around, kids. 2020 was a wild time. <laughs> yeah, we survived it. Yeah, you know, you, I have a theory on 2020 as well. You want to hear? 2020. The reason all of this is going down is because Kobe Bryant. We are being, I mean, he doesn't look good that, like... He's been taken from us way too early. You know, I think that's an argument for why he might be the go. I'm just saying. I mean, we'll see. Hopefully, fingers crossed that when Michael Jordan passes on, hopefully long into his 90s, that the world doesn't just implode. But uh, that's certainly what it feels like to me right now because I know that all these things that are coming on in the world right now, I took that thing to heart. I really, really did. I'm embarrassing how hard I took that down. I mean, 
you know I'm not even a Kobe fan. Sure. I was numb for the rest of the day when I was like, is this real? Like, my group chat that I was in, that's all anybody talked about for the next, like, four days. It's wild. Like, you don't expect something like that to happen. What is that, though, that is in us? Like, you said that, that you were numb. Like, I legitimately, I don't know if I really want to share this story or not, but I, I do because uh, I just, I believe in being transparent. So, all right. So, I'm at a, I'm just going to put it this way. I'll, I'll kind of whitewash the story a little bit. Mm-hmm. I'm at a family get-together because an important figure in my life was uh, having a hard time, and we were kind of addressing that person. Yeah. Um, I'm really going to come off as awful. So I'm not going to finish this story. But bottom line is is that I got a text message from uh, uh, somebody saying, hey, have you read the news? And I'm like, what's that? And, like, and he shared the article with me. And like, oh, my God. I can't this going on. And I left the table. And I left the table so that I could, like, get clear, like, focus on what was actually, to make sure what I was reading was correct. Um, the issues with the story, and I, I, I don't want to come off as awful, but, and there's, I have my reasons for why I'm allowed yeah. to leave that. Reason. But anyways, um, I read that, and I don't know, Dave, explain to me how somebody who has never met that person, that person has no idea of my existence in life, how that can impact me. And it impacted me for weeks. I really admit, it impacted me for a couple of weeks, where every time I thought about it, I didn't necessarily fall like a baby, but like every time I thought about it, I was just like crushed, like spirit crushed. Yeah. Like, what is that? I mean, the only thing I can think of is that, I mean, I know you'll see like posts on like Facebook where they're saying how we shouldn't be, you know, glorifying these sports people to be higher than what they really are. But I mean, we all need some sort of escapism from, you know, doing everything that we do on an everyday basis. Now, Kobe was your favorite player. And I mean, you have an emotional connection where like, you know, you've watched him win titles. You've watched him do this. You've watched him do that. you watched him grow up and do all these different things where just because you haven't met him, you still kind of created an emotional connection with him. We're like, I remember when Barry Sanders retired. And I mean, I was in like third grade, fourth grade. And I just yeah. felt empty. And I didn't even know what that feeling was back then. But I kind of questioned my like enjoyment of like football because I'm like, the guy that I've watched every like Sunday isn't going to play anymore. And I don't really know what to do. The reason at that time you watch is you're literally praying that every play of the game is a handoff to Barry Sanders. It doesn't matter the amount of distance. It doesn't matter. You're just, as a kid, you just want to see him run the ball. Right. You know, as a Kobe Bryant fan, I wanted him to be down by one with every 15, 20 seconds, 24 seconds from the clock to end the game. And I wanted him to take the shot. And if anybody else did, I felt robbed of an opportunity to have another validation, another moment, another whatever memory made with the guy. You're right. It, it is an emotional connection. Let me just kind of, I'll go back to my story. My father, okay, who is uh, basically for the most part of my life has not been consistent. However, the older we get, the more I, I understand this, this man. Um, he was having some complications with his heart. And we were having a, a family get together, basically wanting to ask him, to make sure that he was going to take, you know, the serious. And he has, by all means, and we're very grateful for it. And he's, he's still here today. And he's still fighting and he's doing great. But anyways, long story short, I don't have a lot of great memories with my father. Now, my grandfather, on the other hand, that's a whole other story. He's my best friend in the world. But Kobe Bryant, I can remember... Just as of late of, what, 2016, that would have been 28 years old. I was 28 years old in 2016, sitting in my boxer briefs, living at my grandparents' house, eating a gigantic tub of cereal, watching this man go off for 60. I had to work the next day. He stayed up. It happened way too late. And I, I, I'm literally jumping out of my seat at 28 years old. That's just his final memory he did. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, I, I to me, it's like, dude, I, I just don't know what it is that we as people be clinging to each other like that, but I, I can't, I just, uh, I don't know. Do you have anybody in your life that was uh, a figure like that? Um, 
I mean, I guess the closest thing I would say, not necessarily a figure in particular, just because a lot of my favorite players have always kind of been older ones. I mean, it's kind of like me watching Ohio State football where I'm literally clinging to everything that these 18 to 22-year-old kids are literally doing and, you know, getting angry when things don't go my way. And it's like, there's something i got to take a reflection back and being like, all right calm down but I mean a lot of that for me is I don't have that competitive outlet anymore we're like you know playing sports in high school where I kind of had that whole thing where the Pistons lost when I was in high school I was like man that sucks but like I'm yeah. gonna go get you know hot now or like I'm gonna go get rallies real quick because I'm an 18 year old kid and I can do that but I don't have that kind of outlet so that's one of the things I've kind of realized that I have to kind of do some inner reflection sometimes to be like calm down like we gotta like right. you know, enjoy the highs but you can't really enjoy the lows that much right and i, I can't believe you just hit us with a hot now reference okay. <laughs> <laughs> dude it, you, you, you're so correct on the uh the highs and the lows of the game it's just um and that's what i love about sports and sometimes you can get burned out on sports this is not one of those moments because i i think we're starting even like right we're for it. I'm glad baseball's back. Tigers are doing okay, five and five. Don't know what they did tonight. Um, I think but it's postponed just, because of the, the Cardinals got an outbreak of COVID. So I think we're actually on suspension right now until like. Yeah, it's just one of those things where it's. Um, I, I don't know how to explain it other than when you are in it. Okay, we're both lying here. Let's put it this way. <laughs> Is, I, I hear the jokes all the time about, is it child abuse to make your son or daughter raise them as a Lions fan? And I would say this. There is something to knowing your team isn't going to win at all. And there's like a pride thing. You're like, you're gonna, I'm, a team, I'm a fan because one day it's going to pay off, right? Yes. I hope it's in my life. And that is going to be so damn sweet that it's, I, 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 I starve for that. that it's going to pay off. It's going to be worth it. The issue is, is that Every year at the end of the season when you're disappointed again and you realize that you're not going to make the playoffs, you do have that moment where you're like, ooh. What am I doing? I, what am I doing? <laughs> is, that what, is that they just martyrs as people? Do we like that? What is that? I mean, Why do we like that? I have no idea. I mean, I'm right there with you, though, watching those guys and just being like, yep, here we go, another season. But, I mean, talking about getting caught up in things, I was living in Cleveland when the Cavaliers won it all, and I was downtown Cleveland when they beat the Golden State Warriors in Game 7, and I got caught up in everything. Like, it's just one of those things where when you get the energy around you, that's the one thing I love about sports, though, is it just brings people together that, like, don't necessarily have any sort of connection. I mean, same thing was watching Cleveland Indians in the playoffs a few years yeah. ago when I first moved down here, where, like, there's just a buzz where, that like, you just want to be a part of it and just be a part of something, so... Yeah, it, 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 it is. Be a part of something. You want to be a part of that. I've always, uh, yeah, because, I, I, like, I'm a huge Kobe fan growing up. We, I went to school in Bowling Green State. I went to an Ohio school. Uh, and I got to hear every damn day about how God-like and how great LeBron James is. And I know, I, I, I'm honest about my, my hatred towards that man. I know it's not fair. I respect him and enjoy him more now than I ever have. But the fact that I want to, I have to watch him wear a Lakers uniform is just like it's just a slap in Kobe's face, and I just I, I, I can't I can't ever enjoy it. And I know that's not realistic, but that's the fanaticism that makes it fun. Yeah. Getting the face palm and push back is when you start that's you start so <laughs> pushing into another area. So. Anyways, Dave, man, we've, uh, we're coming up on the hour. What, what else is new? Anything? What, what do you want to talk about? Anything else you want to cover? Um, I, mean, I really don't think. I think we kind of went through everything that I feel like that's been updated in my life. Cause, I mean, we don't leave these four walls all that often. But uh, yeah. outside of that, like, it's uh, just keep it on, you know? How is the adjustment to the uh, – do you find yourself with – Corona, like COVID fatigue, and you find yourself venturing out more, or are you still locked into pretty much everything everybody's saying, and you're still, sit, you know, kind of stay in shelter? What do you have going on? I'm kind of playing everything very kind of safe. Like I'm not necessarily like 
when I went to Las Vegas for like a bachelor party, I definitely came home and did a self quarantine. I also knew I was going to go see my parents. So I kind of wanted to do the right thing. I'm not afraid to go out and do things. It's just, I'm also kind of a homebody by nature. So like, I do crave those different times where, like, every other week I'll go with a buddy and we'll go get wings where, like, you know, we'll do the right thing or we wear the mask until we sit down, you know, take them off there. I wear a mask when I go to, like, the grocery store. Like, I don't think there's anything wrong with that in my eyes. And, I mean, like, I go still see people. And it, I just know if I'm going to go see somebody high risk, I try to be as safe as I can where I kind of have a period where I self-quarantine before I go to see them just to do the right thing in my eyes. But right. I mean, I still kind of live my life for the most part the same. It's just I'm more cognizant when I go out and you're know, making sure that I have the proper precautions. You, I couldn't have said anything better than you. I just went to Vegas as well. Just got back to the self quarantine thing two weeks. I just started walking into my grandparents' house again. Um, you know, it's just the things you have to do for the people you love. But I will say, um, I, I do think we need to just hold though. Let's go. I really, I, maybe I'm maybe I'm being a little bit unrealistic with that, but like with the Major League Baseball thing, it was an, an inevitable that somebody was going to get pace, right? right? So shut everything down because you're afraid of it spreading. Yeah, I understand that to a certain extent, but I also, I'm on the other side. It says, okay, if we get people all the time that get the flu, go to the doctor, they're okay, they get back and they play. Um, Especially those that have the flu and don't show any symptoms of having the flu. You wouldn't even know it, right? So in this case, it's like, I, I, I understand the precaution. I think there was a proper a time for the precaution. Maybe it's just the fatigue in me, but maybe I'm being irresponsible. But I just feel like those who can should be out stimulating the economy, should be out, um, you know, as long as we're still cognizantly aware of taking care of the elders and the, and the ones that are more immune yeah. compromised. As long as we're doing that, I feel like it's time to go. I mean, I'm kind of with you to like an extent. Is that my issue is that the problem that we have to kind of go into these kind of precautions is that they're just assuming that humanity is dumb. And I mean, I'm not gonna lie. For the most part, there are a lot of it, and there's probably a good majority that are like not gonna do the right thing, and they are going to kind of you know ruin it for everybody else. But right. I also kind of feel like we should be able to treat people like adults to an extent too, where it's like it's on them to make the right decision. That's where kind of like I've made the, you know, decision early on that I'm like, okay, I'm going to go see my parents. I know I have to kind of do these precautions where I can't go see anybody for, you know, X amount of time. I have per certain people I consider have been in my kind of quarantine bubble, even though we don't live together, we've been around each other enough where it's like, if I have it, they have it. Right. The issue I think becomes a lot of this and why a lot of people kind of consider this to be a hoax is that, you can contract it, not show any sort of symptoms or everything like that, but you could still be a carrier. And so in their eyes, it's not real, where that's kind of the issue where I'm like, well, that's why we kind of have some of these precautions because of, you know, that yeah. type of thinking where, but I mean, it comes down to us making the right decision and we need to kind of trust people to do that. No, and you do, you do. It's hard when you're, you're, you're trying to police everyone and those when you're policing everyone, the responsible ones are the ones that get frustrated because right. like, now I can go out and be responsible, but I know that there's a pocket of people who can't. Well, I hate to say it, well, those that aren't going to be responsible are the ones that are going to find out the hard way. So it's kind of like lesson learned that way. Um, I don't know, but man, I really enjoyed talking to you, buddy. Yes, yeah, I'm here. First thing I'm doing is going to a movie theater. Are you doing the same? Yes, I am. I can't wait. I'm waiting for the moment that the Gateway Film Center opens up because I'm going to be there immediately. And I was actually kind of bummed the film festival that I go to in October. They end up, well, they I mean, they actually did something that's going to work out better. They're going to do it all online where yeah. I watch every film from home. So it sucks not being able to see all the people and meet all kind of the filmmakers when I can. But at least, you know, they're still kind of carrying on the tradition. Yeah, and you know what? I hope uh, I hope you get to meet some of your idols one of these days and kind of show them your passion because it's something that jumps off the screen to me. It's one of the things that, you know, what I love about Dave and I's relationship, ladies and gentlemen, is that he probably is the person I debate with the most. Um, but I never, at the end of the day, even though we've had some intense, intense battles, um, we're still friends to this day for a reason. And I think that's because we share a lot more in common than we don't. And I, sure. I love you. Because of you. So, yeah, 
Yeah, no, same here. Like, every time, like, I mean, I feel horrible when we've gotten into our, you know, our battles, but, you know, at the end of the day, you know, like you said, I've always respected you, and you're always one of the first people, like, when it comes to, you know, one of the more major films that I've actually went out and saw that, I mean, thinking about, like, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, when I couldn't wait to get a hold of you right after seeing that movie, so. <laughs> yeah, man, uh, for sure, for sure. Um, all right, buddy, well, we'll have to do this again someday down the road. Journey, uh, Journey with a Cinephile. Uh, check it out. The website is what? It's horrorreview.webnode.com. Okay. We'll put the link up on the bottom of this so that you guys can enjoy it. Enjoy checking out David uh, Michigan Garrett on Instagram and Facebook. Uh, yes. Well, Instagram, it's uh, David OSU87. But, yeah, that's my name on Facebook to make it easier okay. to find me. We'll add all of it. Check us out, ladies and gentlemen, Episode 7 with David Garrett, my friend, my family, my brother. Journey with the Cinephile, you can check us out every – Sunday. Um, actually, now I was thinking about it. I get everything ready on Sunday. I post them Monday morning, so it's usually I have it set to post them um, at 5 a.m. on Monday morning, which I realize I did not say that previously, but that's when they actually air. And on Spotify. Yep. Yep. All right, so all you Spotify listeners, go out there, check out this man's podcast. I promise you, if you're a horror fan, you will not be disappointed. This guy has, he's a walking encyclopedia when it comes to those things. Uh, he knows his shit friend of mine, David Garrett. We'll see you down the road. As always, take care. Peace. We did it, buddy. <laughs>